All right, thank you, Stephen. <clears throat> um, so as 2020 thankfully comes to a close, I I'm looking forward to some of the end of the year lists and tributes that we always see at the end of the year. Uh, while most people are going to gravitate to the best Netflix series, the most viral TikTok videos, or the sexiest man or woman alive, I'm wondering what the words or the phrases of the year might be. Corona might be too obvious. Same with sweatpants, Zoom, and well, in the case of the United States, voter fraud. And if I was given a vote, I think I would put, pick the word radicalized. I've been hearing and reading the word radicalized more now than in a quarter century of dabbling in and diving in politics and current events. We're seeing how Trump and QAnon have radicalized the Republican Party in the United States. We're seeing how Brexit has radicalized the UK political class and has fed a black backlash in Scotland as well in clear examples of reciprocal radicalization. In India, Narendra Modi's radicalizing of India's Hindus threatens the world's largest democracy. And of course, the role of ISIS is the latest movement radicalizing followers in Syria, Sub-Saharan Africa, and online as part of a so-called global violent jihad. I spent a decade and a half working in the Western Balkans on issues related to good governance, education, human rights, and anti-corruption. And yet it was only fairly recently, I'd say since around 2015, when suddenly everyone started talking about radicalization and extremism. And remember, I live in a region where hate speech and historical revisionism is basically mainstreamed. In a country, Bosnia and Herzegovina, in which 100,000 people were killed in a war in my adult lifetime, and in a city, Sarajevo, that was the site of the 1914 terrorist attack that started World War I, a city that to this day prides itself on its partisan armed resistance in World War II, and a city which made it through the longest modern day siege in the early 1990s by hosting concerts, beauty pageants, and ultimately a film festival to show that their spirit would not be broken. Even after September 11th, I don't remember hearing the word radical in coverage of Al Qaeda, let alone violent extremism. I remember hearing the word terrorism plain and simple. What's happened that in 2020, we're hearing the word radicalized used for so many contexts, violent and nonviolent, liberal and illiberal, individual and social. I have many, as many people have been thinking about this and think we can look at a number of different historical events that full unfolded in a sequence, unleashing, unleashing ripples that ultimately have become waves. The end of the Cold War ended the tenuous yet certain stability of a bipolar world, NATO and the Warsaw Pact. While, and while the potential for nuclear destruction was great, mutually assured destruction provided at least some rules and guideposts that were shockingly respected as cooler heads prevailed. And sometimes the world just got lucky. It was the rise of a West that had won after the end of the Cold War, the victory of capitalism, liberalism, and individualism. And while a body of Western allies could breathe easily at this fairly peaceful transition, if you didn't pay attention to Yugoslavia, Nagorno-Karabakh, or some other residual conflicts in the former Soviet space, the US seemed to easily emerge as hegemon. For a few glorious years, it seemed US might, accompanied by an allied partnership, could conquer all. Peace in Dayton and Bosnia in 1995, NATO armed intervention to stop potential genocide in Kosovo in 1999, the expansion of multilateral organizations, the integration of China into the World Trade Organization with the belief that with trade and capitalism would come democracy and liberalism. But this period was shorter lived than we might think. <clears throat> the war in Syria followed a series of events that we saw starting with 9-11, leading to wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, the financial crisis in 2008, and new fissures in the economic and social fabric of societies around the world. Uh, the war in Syria was one of the most, it was probably the most important and, and tragic part of the unfolding Arab Spring, which itself started out as a desperate cry for dignity by a Tunisian street vendor, but quickly found solidarity regionally. But re repression in Syria squelched the potential in a brutal way and in the process opened up space for the rise of extremist groups, most notably ISIS and its quote unquote caliphate established or claimed in June 2014. We were able to watch this unfold on TV and on our phones through savvy use of social media and fear. ISIS and its ilk were able to very easily plug into the soft underbelly of fear and malaise that lingered after the 2008 financial crisis. 
It also fed into long-held fears and stereotypes of the Muslim other, the Oriental, the gruesomely exotic. How could they be doing such horrid things? But it was also surprising to suddenly see thousands of people who were traveling to Syria to join in the fight and struggle there, who thought that battlefield could offer them something more than they were finding in their home, whether that home was in Algeria, Egypt, Belgium, Bosnia, or Kosovo. And as attacks in the name of ISIS or its compatriots were committed in Europe, the battlefield suddenly seemed to be everywhere. Then the migration crisis and resulting dominoes started to build on existing domestic insecurity about Europe's borders. And soon we saw Brexit, the rise of Trump, and the rise in mainstreaming of the far right, including in some of Europe's parliaments. <clears throat> this was not unforeseen. Some Cassandras had since the early 1990s warned of the potential of unleashed tribalism and nationalisms. My favorite and one of the most accessible is Benjamin Barber, who in 1995 wrote Jihad versus McWorld, giving a grim view of the dangerous outcomes to be seen when the ideology of values free capitalism came face to face with unleashed, frightened, and often agreed populations, when mass media fed off of and instrumentalized and fed these passions. And this was before the hell of Twitter, remember. And then also endless wars on terror made made it possible to really inure populations to both clash of civilizations thinking and also the notion of endless war as long as it was, it, as it was over there. But I digress a bit. Where was I? That's right. Radicalization and radicalization in the Western Balkans. So following on almost two decades of engagement in Bosnia and other countries in the former Yugoslavia, years of democracy building, institution building, capacity building, and accession, 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 diplomats and security experts in the region were shocked, shocked, when among the thousands of individuals who were going to Syria from around the world, around 900 were from the Western Balkans. And while we saw that classic counterterrorism work was ramped up, through border control, anti-terror legislation, legislation against the foreign financing of terrorism, etc. There was also some new questioning, none of which was meant to relativize or justify these most violent acts, but to try to understand what made humans get to this point. For example, why would anyone want to go to Syria during the war? What videos or narratives or radical charismatic people convinced them to go? What was their vision for the future? What drove them? Or were they just going for the purported promised salaries for a promised 500 or 1,000 euro a month? To be fair, people weren't only asking this in the Balkans. It was almost easier to understand why young Ahmed from a village in Bosnia would decide to go. But it was even more tantalizing to think about why young Gemma in the United Kingdom fell in love online and was convinced to buy a one-way ticket to Gaziantep to become an ISIS bride. What was happening? As CVE, Countering Violent Extremism, emerged as a new practice area, we saw many often well-intended efforts to understand this phenomenon that was so unexpected by so many. However, whether trying to off-ramp at-risk internet users from extremist sites, or to train teachers to understand signs of radicalization, or working with community leaders to develop a whole-of-society approach, there's been a strong tendency to pathologize these individuals, to wonder what was wrong with them to lead them to make this decision at all. Some terrorism experts have pointed out that this is fairly new. Researchers did not wonder why little Patty radicalized in Derry in the 1970s. If his brothers and sisters and uncles and friends were in the IRA and ready to do whatever it took, then it made sense. So why was everyone so eager to pathologize it today? Why was there a disconnect from the broader socioeconomic and structural drivers? Why have so many people working in this field failed to absorb every word of Sarah Chase's Thieves of State, in which she looks at structural factors and primarily at endemic corruption, state capture, and the grievance and indignity that come with it to explain why radicalizing towards violent extremism can perhaps actually seem to be not as irrational as one might think? Or, or Pankaj Mishra's book, and philosophical walk through political violence and ideology in his, age, in his book, Age of Anger. Why are so many afraid to even seek to talk about structures shifting and institutions that we might want to look at, um, even though people are afraid that we might be relativizing terror by looking at these structural sources of conflict? And when will people be more 
open to recognizing the dynamics of reciprocal radicalization that we see between the far right wing and Islamist as described by Julia Ebner in her book, The Rage, a pair of two extremisms that actually have much more in common than any of their adherents would like to admit. People may not like to talk about it, but it is time to talk about political violence. And people may not want to talk about it, but perhaps the question should not be, why did 300 Bosnians go to Syria? But why didn't more go in light of the daily indignities, the daily hate speech, the genocide denial, and the lack of a future vision? What inoculated people so that more did not go? While per capita numbers for Bosnia and Kosovo are high, when judged against the total numbers of Muslims in each country, the foreign fighter numbers look much lower and certainly seem lower than, say, Belgium. One could argue that it's the moderate form of Islam that has been practiced in Bosnia for centuries, or the fatigue with war, having already lived through one, or the loss of faith in the notion that any person through any action can, in fact, make a difference. We can be glad that we have not seen more negative radicalization in Bosnia and the region, but at the same time, we're also not seeing positive of radicalization, an activation of citizens ready to peacefully but forcefully push back against local elites and structures who have denied them a positive vision, but also against an international community that they increasingly feel is not on their side. It's easy to lose track of where the world stands today in terms of state violence and oppression and of citizens trying to stand up against it. Political violence throughout history has often accompanied social change, inequality, status anxiety and oligarchy. And while studies show that peaceful civil resistance in the long term is more effective, in the short term, the political violence reflects deep-seated structural roots, organic, but very often instrumentalized by opportunistic leaders, whether we're talking about Slobodan Milosevic in Serbia in the early 1990s, or Donald Trump's signals to white supremacist militia groups today. Over the past 10 months, my Democratization Policy Council colleagues and I uh, cooperated with Eurothink in North Macedonia. Ivan and Kurt were a part of this, as were Lupjo Petkovsky and Sanada Shelosabic, who participated in earlier events of this series. We conducted a multi-method and multi-dimensional study of socioeconomic conditions, popular rhetoric, and polarization narratives in both countries. We looked at expressions of corruption and state capture and polarization and extremism as they played out at the local level in both countries and in communities where most people don't often go. And initially inspired by Chase, we built a model for thinking not only about polarization, but about the various responses that people in a population can have to enable living through this environment uh, that's characterized by systemic corruption and malgovernance. And we also started to draw up some democratization policies that can help to support this positive movement for something better. In these two countries, where functional and responsible mechanisms for political voice and participation are weak or simply ignored, we hypothesize that citizens have a set of possible survival strategies. On what we called the submissive side, we argued that they can tune out and stop paying attention, sell out and just join the patronage system, or get out and emigrate to Germany, Sweden, or beyond. Another dynamic we identified on the submissive side is what we call the negative freakout, our, our term for negative radicalization, by becoming involved in illiberal extremist activity, either on the far right or ISIS inspired, that promises an escape from the visionless perspective they feel every day, itself a submissive posture as fealty to the extremist associations exacts a price in terms of agency and dignity. Alternatively, and not submissively, but subversively, they can freak out, but in a positive way, and organize in constituencies demanding more accountable, participatory, and functional governments that offer them and their children a sense of meaning, purpose, and belonging. This potential for positive radicalization is not unique to the Western Balkans. We see it happening in various forms globally, through Black Lives Matter, through Extinction Rebellion, through the people taking enormous personal risk in Belarus to protest the indignity suffered to body and society over 30 years. And finding ways to support positive radicalization for a rights-based, accountable democracy that is in fact in line with the liberal values the post-Cold War winners have purported to support 
is important not in just supporting these groups, but in terms of comprehensive security in general. For the inability to address these basic needs through positive peaceful action will risk unleashing an increase in political violence that would hold a greater likelihood of spiraling and escalating. Since the wars in the former Yugoslavia, we have seen many of these dynamics already play out. It's stunning that in Bosnia, for example, the post-war period has not been characterized by acts of violence or revenge. Endemic and institutional segregation and othering has had its intended effect, but it has been top down, as was the war. The question for the academic and policy communities should be how, after years of supporting elites that it is clear are demonstrably not interested in reform or the values and human rights at the core of the transatlantic experiment, albeit imperfectly implemented, how can we read full commitment to achieving this vision, but with citizens as partners, creating pressures for a new vision of leadership? This is more dependent on moral support and will rather than just material support. From the U.S. side, this moral global leadership is something many hope can finally be turned back on fairly quickly with the incoming Biden administration. This is the type of positive radicalization that can help to bring about social change as well as individual change and can possibly put us all back on track from which so many of our countries have been seemingly derailed. And I hope that following on these comments uh, and the comments of my panel colleagues, uh, some of these comments will provide some food for thought and discussion on what's next. Um, that's all I have to say for now. And so back to you, Stefan.